failed horror movies that earned cult classic status with time. The genre of horror has always been an undervalued pillar of the film land. There are so many horror movies that get released every year, and it's literally as easy as pie for some horror flicks to go unnoticed while hitting the theaters and then be simply forgotten. So, there happens to be a number of horror movies that don't get enough commendations. You can call them critically failed, ahead of their time, poorly marketed, underpromoted, or even blame them for their misleading trailers. But these flicks are the ones that actually modified and redefined the trajectory of horror movies to a direction that they remain on to this day as cult classics. Thanks to the concept of time, of course, and diehard fans of the genre for not letting these underrated gems fall into obscurity. Today's video will bring you 13 initially failed horror movies that acquired the classic cult fame with time. Before we go into our list, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click from you, but it means a lot to us. Thank you. Let's begin. Arachnophobia 1990. A new species of spider of a prehistoric origin from Venezuela is inadvertently transported in a coffin with a dead body to America, where it further copulates with a house spider. The inhabitants of a small California town start disappearing as a result of the spider bites from the deadly spider offsprings. Now it all depends on a bunch of doctors and an insect exterminator to wipe out these eight-legged killers before they take over the entire town. Frank Marshall's Arachnophobia without a doubt deserves a lot more attention and fame than it actually got in the 90s. This entertaining horror flick produced by Steven Spielberg will literally take your fear of spiders and amplify it to a whole new level. The usage of real non-CGI spiders and the appealing practical effects make these spiders way more threatening. Even though one actually knows how the movie is going to end, we have 110 minutes of tense story packed with action and excitement. The small spiders, which were used in the movie, were harmless species from New Zealand. In spite of their deadly appearance, this spider is actually a very docile member of the crab spider kin and, in fact, just harmless to humans. The giant one used was a species of a bird-eating tarantula with a leg span of 8 inches or more. These aren't easy to handle and can actually give a nasty bite. Popular American entomologist Stephen R. Kutcher managed and handled the spiders in the movie. So, if just the mere thought of spiders make you feel uncomfortable or shiver, then this is a movie that you unquestionably need to watch right away and face your fear. <laughs> The People Under the Stairs, 1991. Point Dexter Fool Williams happens to be an occupant of a Los Angeles ghetto. On his 13th birthday, he and his sick mother receive an eviction notice that leads him and two others to break into his landlord's house. In an attempted burglary to steal their collection of rare coins, the trio break into a home that's designed to keep people from ever getting out. Locked inside the large suburban house with no means to escape, Fool witnesses the owner's horrendous nature. Addressing themselves as mommy and daddy, they are dangerous psychopaths in possession of a large group of maimed and cannibalistic children confined in their basement. Wes Craven's The People Under the Stairs is an absolute masterpiece that definitely deserved way more attention than what was primarily given to it. The flick is creative and has an arresting storyline, along with very interesting characters. But you literally have to pay detailed attention to this movie, putting your brains to it, because it's so intense. One can hardly miss out on a scene here. Brandon Adams was simply brilliant as the main hero, Fool. Everett McGill and Wendy Roby as the psycho mom and dad were equally creepy in a dangerous way. This movie happens to be a real-life news inspiration about a few crooks breaking into a home in the LA. The investigation revealed something way more sinister than the infringement. 
It turned out that the parents in the otherwise ordinary home kept maltreated and neglected children locked up inside, never allowing them to go outside. This is what triggered Craven to write this film in the first place. His 1991 piece of horror and comedy bursts at the seams with filmic ingenuity. Goes without saying that this fine example of a multi-layered movie, which was previously derided by the snobbish film critics, earned its due cold classic symbol with time. The Dark Half, 1993. Thad Beaumont as a child had to undergo a surgery to remove a tumor from his brain, but during his treatment, it's discovered that far from being just a tumor, the growth was a twin brother of Thad, who never really evolved. Years later, Thad is an accomplished author of highbrow literary novels. Writing his serious books under his own name and the fictions of a darker nature under the pseudonym George Stark. Later, when he is intimidated by someone who has discovered this little secret, Thad puts on a mock burial of George Stark for the benefit of the press. But since then, he time and again becomes the prime suspect in a series of grisly killings. Have. And why? Why me? First off, there's the connection between you and Homer. The pictures. One of which was taken in Homer Cemetery. Yeah, so? One still fails to understand why this jewel of a film has been more or less buried or just passed over by the horror movie community. Not only is this 1993 horror film a fairly neat adaptation of Stephen King's 1989 novel of the same name, but it also appears to be written and directed by a true horror movie icon, the one and only George A. Romero. This is usually the kind of collaboration that fans under normal situations would go absolutely bonkers over. It's sad that the film did not get the proper respect back in 1993. Blame the film's distributor, who was fighting a bankruptcy battle, leading the film underpromoted. But thank goodness to the Scream Factory, who have loaded up the Blu-ray version of the movie, giving it a much more deserved second chance. Not many know this, but as per Stephen King, the plot of the film was part autobiographical, as it happens to be inspired by the events that led him to illuminating his own writing pseudonym, Richard Bachman. Thinner, 1996. Billy Halleck is a fat, upper-class attorney living with his family in a lavish home. In a flick of carelessness, Billy runs over an old gypsy woman who is crossing the street, and then her father places a hex on him. Six weeks passes, and now 93 pounds lighter, Billy is simply petrified. Time is running out for the lawyer, who is drawing closer to his own death as he keeps on growing thinner. The real spectacle of Tom Holland's body horror film is the convincing makeup effects, supervised by the two-time Oscar-winning Greg Canham, that transformed the lean Robert John Burke into an obese man. The special effects and makeup were considered state-of-the-art back in 1996. Originally, the film crew had planned to do an even more ghastly FX makeup, which would have had Billy Halleck's flesh drooping off of his bulging jaw and cheekbones, but halfway into filming, they decided that the look was too horrific, so they carried on with what's shown in the movie. Burke lost close to 20 pounds to essay the role. Burke also had to spend at least four to six hours in the makeup chair, depending upon the phase of his character's deterioration. Coming back to this underrated gem of the 90s... <laughs> Hats off to the plot for being clever and keeping a fairly tongue-in-cheek humor about it. While this movie might not be one of the best Stephen King adaptations, Thinner is a perfect midnight snack for fans who are craving for an unusual dose of King. Thirteen Ghosts, 2001. Arthur, along with his two children, Kathy and Bobby, inherit his uncle Cyrus Criticos's mansion, which is actually a glass house serving as a prison to 12 ghosts held captive by barrier spells. 
When the family, accompanied by Bobby's nanny and an attorney, enter the house, something triggers the mechanism, sealing the house and releasing the ghosts. Assisted by ghost hunter Dennis and his rival Kalina, who happens to be a spirit liberator attempting to free the ghosts, the group must do what they can to get out of the house alive. It has literally been 20 years since the movie hit the screens, and while it's true that 13 Ghosts did not get much love and warmth from the critics at the time, this supernatural horror film directed by Steve Beck has become more of a cult classic among the fans of horror. Every ghost is uniquely designed in the movie, and each of them have equally horrible and tragic backstories. A remake of the 1960 film, this 2001 flick uses the same vanity as its predecessor. The ghosts can only be seen via a special pair of glasses. You see it? It's, it's a ghost. It's a ghost, just like I've been saying all night. Find me a believer. Thank you, O Lord Jesus. These spectacles add a supplementary layer of anxiety to the film, given that the viewers can see the ghosts, but the main characters cannot. Boasting a total of 17 jump scares, the ghost of Jackal will remain in your nightmares for years and years to come. Every ghost that appears in the movie has a detailed tragic backstory, and we have explored each one of them in our separate video. You can find the link to that above. House on Haunted Hill, 1999. When the crooked Stephen Price and his devilish wife Evelyn gives a proposal of $1 million to six strangers, there is just one tiny rule to the game that has to be followed. Everyone has to survive one night at the abandoned Vanicut Psychiatric Institution that's haunted by the ghosts of the inmates who were killed there and a crazy doctor who did unspeakable things. While everyone is having fun initially thinking that the whole thing is just a joke, Soon afterwards, the entire asylum automatically seals itself shut. And then they realize it's no more of a joke. Agreed that this 1999 supernatural horror film directed by William Malone happens to be a remake of the 1959 film bearing the same title. But what a major chunk of reviewers don't understand is the critical difference between a remake and a reimagining. Malone's House on Haunted Hill is definitely an upgrade of the classic story with amazing special effects, Plots like magic mirrors that enable the characters to see what should not be seen, an extremely creepy basement, and a hell of a lot of gore. This flick uses all the mental derangement cliches, such as the creepy location, the never-ending dark hallways, and the cramped treatment rooms to full effects. The sets are super believable and the director has a very fine feeling for horror and insanity put together. Malone was actually shooting an episode of the 1989 American Horror Anthology TV series called Tales of the Crypt in a former asylum when he got the idea for this one. This horror flick was more of a tribute to the horror movies of the 1950s, but with a contemporary twist, of course. Bragging of a dark aesthetic, a scary mystery and notable performances, House on Haunted Hill is literally an underrated modern horror classic that earned its due cult classic status with time. They could bust my fingers one by one by one by one. They could dig out my eyes. Brain Scan, 1994. Michael Brower is a lonely teenager who lives all by himself in his father's mansion. An ardent fan of horror films and video games, Michael comes across an ultra-realistic computer game called Brain Scan, which uses a concept of hypnosis to customize the game into the most terrifying experience one can hardly imagine. But when Michael wakes up from the trance state, he is terrified to find proof that the brutal killings in the game actually happened in real life, and he's the man behind it. Boasting of landline telephonic conversations, interminable plaid shirts, those early computer game graphics, an outright 90s soundtrack, and Edward Walter Furlong at the peak of his popularity. Brain Scan might not be one of the best horror movies created, but it's definitely a major blast from the past for every horror fan.
Needless to say, but this 1994 science fiction horror film still happens to rock in its own way. But if you're wondering why it's overlooked, Brain Scan is a different kind of horror movie, and it was really hard to project the beauty of this movie in a 1.5 minutes long trailer. It's original, very well directed, and has a great cast. One is bound to find this movie far more gripping than the usual slasher flicks, or even the monster movies. John Flynn's Brain Scan is highly recommended to anyone who is on the lookout for film that has the craziness of 90s, but still manages to tell an extremely interesting story. Exorcist 3, 1990 Lieutenant William F. Kinderman and Father Dyer try to cheer each other up on the death anniversary of their mutual friend, Father Damien Karras, by going to see a movie at the local theater in Georgetown. But with a particularly cruel and gruesome serial killer on the loose, nothing can distract Kinderman. The killer's murders include a lot of torment, beheadings, and the violation of religious icons. And if that's not bad enough, his killings also resemble those of the Gemini killer, who has been dead for 15 years. Nor canst thou kill me. I was only 21 when I died. Writer and director William Peter Blatty's Exorcist 3 is a hidden treasure that actually carries on the legacy of the maiden exorcist. Just in case you were wondering what you get when you mix a demonic serial killer, a detective questioning his faith, and the most frightening jump scare. Let us help you out here. You get one eerie as hell cult classic. Filled with scenes that are bound to scare the living shit out of you, and if you have liked the original film, you will definitely like this one provided that you keep an open mind and don't expect a ditto copy of the original. Classic thrillers have their own style, and so much is left to the imagination of the viewers. And speaking of this 1990 cult classic, there's a bunch of very appalling and dreadful things to imagine. Also, the role of Gemini Killer happens to be inspired by the real-life serial killer, the Zodiac. The Cell, 2000 Child psychologist Catherine Dean is part of a revolutionary new treatment that allows her mind to literally enter the minds of her cases. However, things take a 360-degree turn when she is asked to enter the mind of notorious serial killer Carl Starger in his comatose state in order to learn where he has hidden his recent kidnapped victim. Um, where is she? Where's Julia? Tarsum Singh's science fiction psychological horror film happens to be possibly one of the most underappreciated serial killer movies that has ever been created. The viewers are going to love Singh for focusing on presenting such an astonishing melange of a visual and audible expedition into the mind of a serial killer. The dream sequences in the film are splendidly shot using many camera tricks, spooky color distributions, graphic images, and a very tense score. The amazing visual display of the film is perhaps what makes this an artistic masterpiece and a petrifying thriller. Vincent D'Onofrio is simply exceptional as the serial killer with a twisted mind. Give this movie a shot for him. This movie was totally ahead of its time, and it plays around with absolutely insane ideas that might have pushed back a lot of traditional critics back in the day. But then, as the people watched the film on TV, they started to understand the beauty of this masterpiece. The Frighteners, 1996. After a tragic car accident that kills architect Frank Bannister's wife, he grows a psychic potential to see and communicate with ghosts. 
Frank soon puts his talents to use, making friends with a few ghosts and getting them to haunt houses in the area. He later comes in and exercises the houses, charging them his fee of course, but soon he comes upon a spectral, hooded entity appearing as the Grim Reaper, who is killing people by marking numbers on their forehead first, something which only Frank can see. This 1996 movie by Peter Jackson initially sets out to be a comedy film with ghosts, but it's quite surprising how it alters into a very dark supernatural thriller. The special effects used in the movie still looks great, even by today's standards. And with such a solid plotline, good direction, great cast and character development, there's not really much to crib about in this movie. The CGI is great for that time and the Grim Reaper shots will still give you the creeps, even so many years later. But it's really very surprising how this film has been overlooked by so many movie lovers. Frankly, this is an undervalued film that is well worth watching. Oh, you're wrong, Decker. We're both dead. Boone. Don't you get it? Nightbreed, 1990. Aaron Boone has nightmares of a hidden city called Midian, a place where monsters are forgiven and accepted. A serial killer is on the loose and killings are happening all around. Boone's is taking help from a crooked psychotherapist, Dr. Philip Decker, so that he can get rid of his nightmares. But his doctor convinces him that Aaron himself is the serial killer, and he should surrender to the police. Soon after the lethal encounter with the police, Boone discovers that Midian exists in real life and his girlfriend Lori is left to uncover the truth for herself. Unfortunately for all, the real killer has his own plans of destroying the ancient breed of monsters. The 1990 Nightbreed might have been disregarded in the 90s, but this dark fantasy horror film happens to be Clive Barker's masterpiece. Over the years, this flicks fictional fable of a close-knit clan of creatures who live beneath a massive graveyard has acquired a classic cult following. In many interviews, Barker has stated that his content of misinterpreted monsters may come from his own struggles as a gay male. Coming back to the movie, everything from the sets, apparels, makeup, special effects, to the matte paintings are perfect. And if the studios hadn't intervened in the creative aspects of the film, it could have been a massive hit. It's really sad that this film was a commercial and critical failure, especially with Barker claiming that the producers tried to sell the movie as a run-of-the-mill slasher, when the movie was much deeper than how it was portrayed in the market material. Even the posters were extremely stupid and misguided the viewers. If you are planning to watch this, you need to have the director's cut, which is much more closer to the end product that Clive Barker wanted to show his audience. Having said that, Nightbreed was an expensive movie for horror genre, and the way money was being poured out, it made the suits nervous. Trick or Treat, 2007 Halloween happens to be the night when the dead rise to walk among us and other dreadful things roam around free. The traditions of All Hallows Eve were created to safeguard us from their wicked mischief, but one little town is about to be taught a horrendous lesson that some traditions are best not disregarded. The story revolves around four interwoven stories that occur on Halloween. Well, if you missed out on Michael Doherty's 2007 Trick or Treat during its offensively brief theatrical run, you can actually be forgiven for not being aware of the seasonal favorite. The mascot character Sam is perhaps one of the primary segments of what makes this flick such a Halloween treasure. You are bound to give appreciation to the director as he explains each of the four parts of the movie, giving emphasis on what Halloween is like at a particular age. The first one talks about Halloween, when you are still young enough to be dependent on your parents for literally everything. The dangers of trick-or-treating and the need of waiting for your parents to assist you in carving out a pumpkin. 
The second one talks about when you are starting to age out trick-or-treating and more eager to cause troubles. The third one is about Halloween in your 20s, when it's mostly about saucy costumes and hookups. The final segment is about Halloween when you are kind of a little too old for the holiday and an age which none of us will hopefully ever reach unless we happen to meet a destiny matching up to Mr. Krieg. We don't want to go too deep into the stories, because they are short and each one of them has their own catchy moments. This is all the time we had for today's episode. We hope you guys liked it. It would be awesome if you guys can take some time to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to tell us which topic you want us to cover in the comment section. Have a fantastic day ahead and stay safe.